Hello and welcome to Lecture 8, Evidence and Models of Plate Tectonics. Although Earth's total surface area does not change, the size and shape of individual plates are constantly changing. For example, the African and Antarctic plates are mainly bounded by divergent boundaries. They're sites of seafloor spreading production, and so they are continually growing in size as new lithosphere is added to their margins. By contrast, the Pacific Plate is being consumed into the mantle, along with much of its flanks faster than it is being generated along the East Pacific rise, and thus is diminishing in size. Another result of plate motion is that boundaries migrate. For example, the position of the Peru-Chile Trench, uh, which is the result of the Nazca Plate being bent downward as it descends beneath the South American Plate, has changed over time. Because of the westward drift of the South American plate relative to the Nazca plate, the Peru-Chile trench has migrated in a westerly direction as well. Plate boundaries can also be created or destroyed in response to changes in the forces that are acting on the lithosphere. For example, some plates carrying continental crusts are presently moving toward one another. In the South Pacific, Australia is moving northward towards Asia. If Australia continues its northward migration, the boundary separating it from Asia will eventually become inactive and disappear as these two plates become one. Other plates are moving apart. Recall that the Red Sea is the site of a relatively new spreading center that came into existence less than 20 million years ago, when the Arabian Peninsula began to break apart from Africa. The breakup of Pangaea is a classic example of how plate boundaries change through geological time. Wagner used evidence from fossils, rock types, and ancient climates to create a jigsaw puzzle fit of the continents, thereby creating his supercontinent Pangaea. By employing modern tools not available to Wagner, geologists have recreated the steps in the breakup of this supercontinent, an event that began anywhere from 180 to 200 million years ago. From this work, the dates when individual crustal fragments separated from one another and their relative motions have been well established. An important consequence of Pangaea's breakup was the creation of a new ocean basin, basin the Atlantic. Splitting of the supercontinent did not occur simultaneously, however, along all of the margins of the Atlantic. The first split developed between North America and Africa. So you can see that between images A and B, here everything's connected in Pangaea, but after a couple tens of millions of years, North America and Africa started to push apart. Here, the continental crust was highly fractured, providing pathways for huge quantities of fluid lavas to reach the surface. Today, these lavas are represented by weathered igneous rocks found along the eastern seaboard of the United States, primarily buried beneath the sedimentary rocks that formed from the continental shelf. Radiometric dating of these solidified lavas indicates that rifting began around 190 to 200 million years ago in this location. This time span represents the birth date for this section of the North Atlantic Ocean. By about 130 million years ago, the South Atlantic began to open up near the tip of what is now known as South Africa. As this zone of rifting migrated northward, it gradually opened the South Atlantic Ocean. Continued breakup of the southern landmass led to the separation of Africa and Antarctica and sent India on a northward journey. By the early Cenozoic era, which is about five, uh, 50 million years ago, Australia had separated from Antarctica and the South Atlantic had become fully fledged. India eventually collided with Asia, an event that began about 50 million years ago and has created the Himalayan mountains and the Tibetan highlands. About the same time, the separation of Greenland from Eurasia completed the breakup of the northern landmass. During the past 20 million years or so, so relatively recently in Earth's history, Arabia has rifted from Africa to form the Red Sea, and the Baja California has separated from Mexico to form the Gulf of California. 
Meanwhile, the Panama Arc joined North America and South America to produce our globe's familiar modern appearance. So here is an animated GIF of the breakup of Pangaea. So notes, we're going to watch this a few times. Notes, when it starts over, the first thing that happens is uh, Africa and North America split apart. And then you can see the South Atlantic opening up from the bottom up. Uh, you can also see India right here break off and move up toward the A Asian plate where it makes the Himalayan mountains. And you'll also note that Australia migrates northward as well. So it's very fascinating to watch this unfold. And so we'll watch one more pass before we move on here. Okay, well, we can look back at the past, or we can even step this into the future. Geologists have extrapolated present-day plate movements into the future. The figure at the top illustrates where Earth's landmasses may be 50 million years from now, if present plate motions persist during this time span. In North America, we see the Baja Peninsula and the portion of Southern California that lies west of San Andreas Fault, will have slid past the North American plate. So the Baja of California, or the Baja Peninsula, which usually extends down right here, actually is sliding northward. Uh, if this northward migration continues, interestingly enough, Los Angeles and San Francisco will actually pass one another in about 10 million years. And in about 60 million years, the Baja Peninsula will begin to collide with the Aleutian Islands up near uh, Alaska. If Africa maintains its northward path, it will continue to collide with Eurasia. The result will be the closing of the Mediterranean Sea, the last remnant of a once vast ocean called the Tethys Ocean, and the in initiation of another major mountain building episode. Australia will be astride the equator, and along with New Guinea, will be on a collision course with Asia. Meanwhile, North and South America will begin to separate while the Atlantic and Indian Oceans will continue to grow at the expense of the Pacific Ocean. A few geologists have even speculated on the nature of the globe 250 million years in the future, as you can see in the bottom right image. In this scenario, the Atlantic seafloor will eventually become old and dense enough that it forms subduction zones along much of its margins. Not unlike the present-day Pacific Basin, Continued subduction of the Atlantic Ocean floor will result in the closing of the Atlantic Basin and the collision of the Americas with the Eurasian African landmass to form the next supercontinent. Support for the possible closing of the Atlantic comes from evidence for a similar event, when an ocean predating the Atlantic closed during Pangaea's formation. Australia is also projected to collide with Southeast Asia by that time. If this scenario is accurate, the dispersal of Pangaea will end with the continents reorganizing into the next supercontinent. Uh, to be clear, though, such projections, although interesting, must be viewed with considerable skepticism, because many assumptions are being made, um, and they must be correct for these events to unfold as just described. Nevertheless, Changes in the shapes and positions of continents that are equally profound will undoubtedly occur for many hundreds or millions of years to come. Only after much more of Earth's internal heat has been lost will the engine that drives plate motion cease. So we'll learn about this more later, but um, planets cool, so the crust is getting thicker and thicker over very long periods of time, so eventually it'll be thick enough to where this motion ceases. So let's talk evidence. Some of the evidence supporting continental drift was presented earlier in these lectures, so in our previous lecture. With the development of plate tectonic theory, researchers began testing this new model of how Earth works. In addition to new supporting data, new interpretations of already existing data often swayed the tide of opinion. Some of the most convincing evidence for seafloor spreading came from the Deep Sea Drilling Project, which operated from 1966 until 1983. One of the early goals of the project was to gather samples of the ocean floor in order to establish its age. To accompany this, a drilling ship capable of working in water thousands of meters deep was built. 
Hundreds of holes were drilled through the layers of sediment that blanketed the ocean crust, as well as into the basaltic rock below. Rather than using radiometric dating, which can often be unreliable on oceanic rocks because of the alteration of basalt by seawater, researchers dated the seafloor by examining the fossil remains of microorganisms found in the sediments resting directly on the crust at each site. When researchers recorded the age of the sediment from each drilling site and its distance from the center ridge, or the ridge crest, they found that the sediment increased in age with increasing distance from the ridge. This finding supported the seafloor spreading hypothesis, which predicts that the younger oceanic crust would be found at the crest ridge in the middle, the site of seafloor production, and the oldest oceanic crust would be found adjacent to the continents, or far away. So the very first thing is, the further away you get from the center, the older the materials get. The distribution and thickness of ocean uh, floor sediments provided additional verification of seafloor spreading. Drill cores from the ship revealed that sediments are almost entirely absent on the ridge crest in the middle, and that sediment thickness increased with increasing distance from the ridge. This pattern of sediment distribution should be expected if the seafloor spreading hypothesis is correct. So that makes sense, so the material at the center is brand new, so not much sediment has fallen on top of it and covered it up. But the further away you go and the older you get, more and more time has passed for sediment to build up, so it gets thicker the further away you go. The data collected by the Deep Sea Drilling Project also reinforced the idea that the ocean basins are geologically young because no seafloor is older than 180 million years was found. By comparison, most continental crust exceeds several hundred million years in age, and some samples are more than 4 billion years of age. In 1983, a new ocean drilling program was launched by the Joint Oceanographic Uh, institutions for deep earth samplings. Now, the International Ocean Discovery Program, or IODP, uh, this ongoing international effort uses multiple vessels for exploration. One of the goals of the IODP is to recover a complete section of the oceanic crust from top to bottom. Mapping volcanic islands and seamounts, or submarine volcanoes, in the Pacific Ocean, revealed several linear chains of volcanic structures. One of the most studied chains consists of at least 129 volcanic structures that extend from the Hawaiian Islands to Midway Island and continue northwestward near the Aleutian Trench. Radiometric dating of this linear feature, called the Hawaiian Island Emperor Seamount Chain, showed that the volcanoes increase in age with increasing distance from the big island of Hawaii. The youngest volcanic island in the chain, uh, Hawaii, rose from the ocean floor less than one million years ago, whereas Midway Island, far out in the Pacific Ocean, is 27 million years old, and the Detroit Seamount near the Aleutian Trench is even older at about 80 million years old. One widely accepted hypothesis proposes that a roughly cylindrical upwelling of hot rock that originates deep in the mantle, called a mantle plume, is located beneath the island of Hawaii. As the hot rock, uh, well, as the hot rocky plume ascends through the mantle, the confining pressure drops, which triggers partial melting. The surface manifestation of this activity is what's known as a hot spot, an area of volcanism high heat flow and crustal uplifting that is a few hundred kilometers across. As the Pacific Plate moves over the hotspot, which is thought to maintain a relatively fixed position, a chain of volcanic structures known as a hotspot track is built. The age of each volcano indicates how much time has elapsed since it was situated over the mantle plume. Of approximately 40 hotspots that are thought to have formed because of upwelling of hot mantle plumes, most, but all, not all, have these hotspot tracks. So, here we have a huge track, the Hawaiian chain, where the island, the big island of Hawaii is the youngest, and all the way back past the Midway Island, these get older and older. And so this forms because you have a single mantle plume that stays fixed in place. 
But while mantle uh, material is rising up and creating a volcanic uh, structure, the plate above it is moving to the left. And so material rises up, forms a volcano that moves away, and the material is still rising, so it creates another volcano that moves away, and so on and so forth. So you end up with a long chain. A closer look at the five largest Hawaiian islands reveals a similar pattern of age, from the volcanically active island of Hawaii to the inactive volcanoes that make up the oldest island, Kauai. Five million years ago, when Kauai was positioned over the hotspot, it was the only modern Hawaiian island in existence. Kauai's age is evident in the island's inactive volcanoes, which have been eroded into jagged peaks and vast canyons. By contrast, the relatively young island of Hawaii exhibits many fresh lava flows, and one of the five major volcanoes, Kilauea, remains active today. In fact, um, I'm, f I'm filming this at the beginning of 2019, but just last year in 2018, we saw numerous lava flows occurring on the surface of the Big Island. Although the mantle plume hypothesis provides a compelling explanation for volcanism that occurs in the middle of a tectonic plate, the existence of a slim mantle plume that originates near Earth's core, mantle boundary, has not been verified by seismic studies. As a result, some geologists have proposed that the source of magma that generated the Hawaiian chains uh, originated from localized melting in the upper mantle. You may be familiar with how a compass operates and know that Earth's magnetic field has a north and a south pole. Today, these magnetic poles roughly align with the geographic poles that are located where Earth's rotational axis intersects the surface. In other words, where we have the north pole of the Earth, we have a magnetic pole. Where we have the south pole of the Earth, we also have a magnetic pole. Earth's magnetic field is similar to that produced by a simple bar magnet. Now, I don't have a video for this, but I'm going to see if I can find one and link it in the YouTube description. So take a look in the description just in case I find a good one to share. Regardless, invisible lines of force pass through the planet and extend from one magnetic pole to the other. So you can see that here. We have one pole, the magnetic field lines come out and back in at the north side. So um, Earth's magnetic field is less obvious to us than the pole of gravity uh, because we can't feel it. Movement of a compass needle, however, confirms its presence. In addition, some naturally occurring minerals are magnetic and are influenced by Earth's magnetic field. One of the most common uh, is the iron-rich mineral called magnetite, which is abundant in lava flows of basaltic composition. Basaltic lavas erupt at the surface at a temperature greater than 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, exceeding a threshold temperature for magnetism known as the Curie point at about 1085 degrees Fahrenheit. The magnetite grains in molten lava are non-magnetic, non but as the lava cools, these iron-rich grains become magnetized and they align themselves in the direction of the existing magnetic lines of force. Once the minerals solidify, the magnetism that they possess remains frozen in this position. Thus, they act like a compass needle because they point toward the position of the magnetic poles at the time of their formation. Rocks that formed thousands or millions of years ago and that contain a record of the direction of the magnetic poles at the time of their formation are said to possess paleomagnetism or preserved magnetism. A study of paleomagnetism in ancient lava flows throughout Europe led to an interesting discovery. Taken at face value, the magnetic alignment of iron-rich minerals in lava flows of different ages would indicate that the position of the paleomagnetic poles has changed over time. A plot of the location of the magnetic north pole, as measured from Europe, seemed to indicate that during the past 500 million years, the pole had gradually wandered from a location near Hawaii northeastward to its present location over the Arctic Ocean. This was strong evidence that either the magnetic north pole had migrated, an idea known as polar wandering, or that the poles had remained in place and the continents themselves had drifted beneath them. In other words, Europe had drifted relative to the north pole. 
Although the magnetic poles are known to move in a somewhat erratic path, studies of paleomagnetism from numerous locations show that their positions, uh, averaged over thousands of years, correspond closely to the positions that we see today. Therefore, a more acceptable explanation for the apparent polar wandering was prov provided by Wagner's hypothesis. If the magnetic poles remain stationary, their apparent movement is produced by the drift of the seemingly fixed continents. continents. Further evidence for continental drift came a few years later, when a polar wandering path was constructed for North America. For the first 200 million years or so, the paths for North America and Europe were found to be very similar in the same direction, but separated by about 3,000 miles. Then, during the middle of the Mesozoic era, 180 million years ago, they began to converge on the present North Pole. The explanation for these curves is that North America and Europe were joined until the Mesozoic era, when the Atlantic began to open up. From this time forward, these continents continually moved apart. When North America and Europe are moved back to their pre-drift positions, these paths of apparent polar wandering coincide. This is evidence that North America and Europe were once joined and moved relative to the poles as part of the same continent. More evidence emerged when geophysicists learned that over periods of hundreds to thousands of years, Earth's magnetic field periodically reversed in polarity. During this magnetic reversal, the magnetic north pole becomes the magnetic south pole, and vice versa. Lava that solidified during a period of reverse polarity has been magnetized with the polarity opposite to that of those being formed today. When rocks exhibit the same magnetism as the present magnetic field, they are said to possess normal polarity, whereas rocks exhibiting opposite magnetism are said to have reverse polarity. Once the concept of magnetic reversals was confirmed, researchers set out to establish a timescale for these occurrences. The task was to measure the magnetic polarity of hundreds of lava flows and use radiometric dating techniques to establish a relative age for each flow. Meanwhile, oceanographers had begun magnetic surveys of the ocean floor in conjunction with their efforts to construct detailed maps of seafloor topography. These magnetic surveys were accomplished by towing very sensitive instruments called magnetometers, or magnetometers behind the research vessels. The goal of these geophysical surveys was to map variations in the strength of Earth's magnetic field that arise from differences in magnetic p uh, properties of the underlying crustal rock. <clears throat> the first comprehensive study of this type was performed off the Pacific coast of North America and had an unexpected outcome. Researchers discovered alternating stripes of high and low intensity magnetism. This relatively simple pattern of magnetic variation defied explanation until 1963 when Fred uh, Vine and D.H. Matthews demonstrated that the high and low intensity stripes supported the concept of seafloor spreading. Vine and Matthews suggested that the stripes of high intensity magnetism are regions where the paleomagnetism of the ocean crust exhibits normal polarity. Consequently, these rocks enhance or reinforce Earth's magnetic field. Conversely, <clears throat> the low-intensity stripes are regions where the ocean crust is polarized in a reverse direction, and therefore tend to weaken the existing magnetic field. But how do parallel stripes of normal and reverse uh, magnetized rock become distributed across the ocean floor? Well, that's a great question. Vine and Matthews reasoned that as magma solidifies at the crest of an oceanic ridge, it is magnetized with the polarity of Earth's magnetic field at that time. Because of seafloor spreading, this strip of magnetized crust would gradually increase in width, like you see at the top in A. With a reverse in the polarity of Earth's magnetic field, any newly formed seafloor having this reverse polarity would seem to form in the middle of the old strip. 
Gradually, the two halves of the old strip would be carried in opposite directions away from the ridge crest. Subsequent reversals, as you can see in B and C, would build a pattern of normal and reverse magnetic stripes. Because new rock is added in equal amounts to both trailing edges of the spreading ocean floor, we should expect that the pattern of stripes, that is the width in their polarity, found on one side of an oceanic ridge should be the mirror image of that on the other side. In fact, a survey across the Mid-Atlantic Ridge just south of Iceland reveals a pattern of magnetic stripes exhibiting a remarkable degree of symmetry in relation to their axis. Geophysical evidence confirms that although the mantle consists almost entirely of solid rock, it is hot and weak enough to exhibit a slow, fluid-like convective flow. The simplest type of convection is analogous to heating a pot of water on a stovetop. Heating the base of the pot warms the water, which makes it less dense and more buoyant, and then causes it to rise in a relatively thin sheet or in blobs that tend to spread out at the surface. As the surface layer cools, its density increases, and the cooler water sinks back to the bottom of the pot, where it is reheated until it achieves enough buoyancy to rise once again. Mantle convection is very similar to, but of course considerably more complex than the model just described. Geologists generally agree that subduction of cold, dense slabs of oceanic lithosphere is a major driving force of plate motion. This phenomenon, called slab pull, which you can see on the far right here, occurs because cold slabs of oceanic lithosphere are more dense than the underlying warm athenosphere, and hence tend to sink like a rock, meaning that they are pulled down into the mantle by gravity. Another important driving force is the ridge push, which you can see in the middle. This gravity-driven mechanism results from the elevated position of the oceanic ridge in the center, which causes slabs of lithosphere to quite literally slide down the flanks of the ridge, and push them apart. Despite its importance, however, ridge push contributes far less to plate motions than does slab pull. The primary evidence for this is that the fastest moving plates, that is the Pacific, Nazca, and Cocos plates, have extensive subduction zones along their margins. By contrast, the spreading rate in the North American, uh, excuse me, in the North Atlantic basin, which is nearly devoid of subduction zones, is one of the lowest, at about 2 inches per year. Although convection in the mantle is not yet fully understood, researchers generally agree on the following. Convective flow, in which warm, buoyant mantle rock rises, while cool, dense lithospheric plates sink, is the underlying driving force for plate motion. Next, mantle convection and plate tectonics are part of the same system. Subducting oceanic plates drives the cold, downward-moving portion of convective flow, while the shallow upwelling of hot rock along the oceanic ridge and buoyant mantle plumes are the upward-flowing arms of the convective mechanism, as you can kind of see in the animated GIF on the right. Convective flow in the mantle is a major mechanism for transporting heat away from the Earth's interior and to the surface, where it is eventually radiated into space. What is not known, with certainty, is the exact structure of this convective flow. Several models have been proposed for plate mantle convection, and in the next two slides we'll take a look at two of them. The first of which is the whole mantle convection model. One group of researchers favors some type of whole mantle convection, also called the plume model, in which cold oceanic lithosphere sinks to great depths and stirs the entire mantle, as you can see here on the left and right. So the lithosphere actually sinks all the way down to near the core. Two kinds of plumes have been proposed, narrow tube-like plumes and giant upwellings, often referred to as megaplumes. The long, narrow plumes are thought to originate from the core mantle boundary and produce hotspot volcanism of the type associated with the Hawaiian Islands and Iceland, for example. Scientists believe that areas of large megaplumes occur beneath the Pacific Basin and southern Africa. 
These megaplumes are thought to explain why southern Africa has an elevation much higher than would be predicted for a stable continental landmass. In this whole mantle convection model, heat for both the narrow plumes and the megaplumes is thought to arise mainly from Earth's core. While the deep mantle uh, provides a source for chemically distinct magmas. However, some researchers have questioned the idea and instead propose that the source of magma for most of this hotspot volcanism is actually found in the upper mantle or the athenosphere, far away from the core. So that brings us to our second of two models that we'll discuss, the layer cake model. Some researchers argue that the mantle resembles a layered cake divided at a depth of about 410 to 620 miles. This layered model has two zones of convection instead of just one, like in the previous. A thin, dynamic layer in the upper mantle, and a thick, larger, and sluggish one located below. As with the whole mantle model, the downward convective flow is driven by the subduction of cold, dense oceanic lithosphere. However, Rather than reach the lower mantle, these subducting slabs penetrate to depths of no more than 620 miles. Notice that the upper layer in this layer cake model is littered with recycled oceanic lithosphere of various ages. According to this model, melting of the fragments would be the source of magma for some of the volcanism that occurs away from plate boundaries such as hotspot volcanism. So they actually believe that the broken pieces of the lithosphere melt in this upper region, and from there we get the the hotspot volcanism, not from the core. In contrast to the active upper mantle, the lower mantle in the layer cake model is sluggish and does not provide material to support volcanism to the surface. Very slow convection within this layer likely carries heat upward, but very little mixing occurs between the two layers. Geologists continue to debate the nature of convective flow in the mantle. As they investigate the possibilities, perhaps a widely accepted hypothesis that might combine both features of the two models may emerge. And I always just think it's interesting considering the fact, you know, we've lived on Earth, well, forever uh, in, in terms of humanity's existence, and we still know very little about the interior of our own planet. So it's always interesting to see what developments are being made. Okay, at this point, let's go ahead and take a look at a few questions. So, um, as always, read the question and then pause the video until you think you know an answer and continue. Question 1. Today, blank is in about the same geographic position as it was about 90 million years ago. The uh, The answer is D. Antarctica is in roughly the same geographic position as it was 90 million years ago. Question number two. Plate tectonic evidence indicates that which of the following is likely to occur in the future? All right, this one is D. We will see that the Atlantic Ocean will eventually close. Well into the future, continued subduction of the oceanic floor in the Atlantic will result in the closing of its basin. Note again that today there is not much subduction in the Atlantic Ocean, But in the future, it might get old enough to where that does happen, and then it closes up. Question number three. The Hawaiian Islands formed above a blank. Well, in this case, it is a hotspot. They provide evidence of plate tectonics because they have formed over a stationary hotspot while the plates they are on have moved over it. And our last question. Number four, examine the map of magnetic stripes below. What can you conclude about the central red zone? So a lot of interesting options here. Well, the answer for this one is E. It is a spreading center because we see that the two uh, regions are moving apart, and it also shows the youngest rocks on the map. In the center, this is where we have the Atlantic Ridge, or any ridge, It's a spreading center, and in the middle, new mantle material is flowing up through the center and generating new lithosphere. So this material is young, and then it gets pushed away, so further and further material is older. Okay, so at this point, we have concluded our discussion of plate tectonics. 
Now we'll discuss some of the effects of them. So in our next few lectures, we're going to be looking at earthquakes and volcanoes. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day.